takes so long through such a long chain of events, uh, a long cascade that can take up to a decade or more for some people, that it's so often left off of the death certificate. So what are the sort of next steps going forward? Yeah, the next steps going forward, well, we, we need other research, uh, large cohorts of older people to corroborate these findings, support them. Um, but, you know, more we, we just, policy-wise, we think that, you know, this, this hopefully can open the eyes of lawmakers and policymakers and private and public funders and just the pu public in general that this is, you know, a very burdensome disease on our society. All right, Dr. Brian James from Rush University, thanks so much. Thank you very much. Again, the major developments of the day. President Obama told Russian President Vladimir Putin his country's actions violate Ukraine's sovereignty. The two leaders spoke by phone for about an hour this afternoon. President Obama said there's still room for a diplomatic solution that includes direct talks between Ukraine and Russia. On the news hour online right now, meet the microscopic phytoplankton that helps produce oxygen in our atmosphere. They've been around for three and a half billion years and are the reason we breathe today. But scientists are still unlocking their secrets. You can find all that and more on our website, newshour.pbs.org. And that's the news hour for tonight. On Friday, we'll have an exclusive interview with General Martin Dempsey, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, on the crisis in Ukraine and sexual assaults in the military. I'm Gwen Eiffel. We'll see you online and again here tomorrow evening with Mark Shields and Michael Gerson. For all of us here at the PBS News Hour, thank you and good night. Major funding for the PBS News Hour has been provided by. for 160 years. BNSF, the engine that connects us. Charles Schwab, proud supporter of the PBS NewsHour. And by BAE Systems, inspired work. The William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, helping people build measurably better lives. And with the ongoing support of these institutions and foundations. And...
Control your TV with your voice. The X1 Entertainment Operating System. Only for www.cityofcapitola.org. Tonight's technician is Victor Herman. As a reminder, please turn off your cell phones during the meeting, and if you can, please sign in when you come up, if you care to sign in when you come up to speak. Thank you. Roll call, please. Commissioner Welch? Here. Commissioner Graves? Here. Commissioner Smith? Here. Commissioner Ruth? Here. And Chairperson Ortiz? Here. Please stand and uh, follow me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Oral communications are next. Uh, any additions or deletions to the minutes? I know we have one item that is going to be pulled from the consent calendar. That's item E507 Plum Street and 712 Capitola Avenue. Um, there is one change to Exhibit A for both items, um, for C and for D, for 4605 Emerald Street and 4625 Emerald Street. You have them before you. Okay. Um, and they were wrong within the electronic packet. I've also placed out the correct set of plans on the back table. So, that so if anyone is here for items that have to do with the two Emerald Street applications, there are corrections to be seen and you should go to the back of the room and pick those corrections up to take a look at them. Otherwise, this, all of these items on the consent calendar will be voted on in one motion unless uh, others are pulled uh, by either members of the community or the commission. So um, are there any other um, additions or deletions to the agenda? No additional. Okay. Uh, now's the time for public comments. Um, these are comments about things that are not on tonight's agenda. So if you're here tonight to talk to us about something that is not on this agenda, please step forward. We'd love to hear from you. Okay. Looks like everybody's here for, for something that's on the agenda. So we'll move on to commissioner comments. Not here. None? Okay, staff? No comments. None now? Okay. Then we'll go on to the approval of the minutes for the February the 6, 2014 Planning Commission meeting. Any additions, corrections, changes to that? Move the minutes. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Uh, the Before next Before you go to the consent, uh, you mentioned that some items had been pulled from there. What were they again? Yeah, the item that was pulled from it is by item E, 507 Plum Street. Okay. That was pulled by the applicant. Okay. Okay. And then there are a couple of changes to the Emerald Street uh, application. I understood that. Was it pulled completely or is it? It's pull it's no, it's going to be heard under, um, okay. I believe it's going to be heard under hearings tonight, under correct? Five, 5C then? Then 5C. Okay. Sounds good. Can we do it for four, five? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah, that works better. Uh, uh, so that will be five. Uh, I would suggest um, making that 5A. I think it'll be the shortest yeah. item. Sounds good. We'll put it at the, at the head of the public hearings. So now we will go to the consent calendar, which is voted on in one motion, uh, unless someone pulls others or wants to speak about others. Hey, Madam Chairperson, I have to recuse myself from this item at least two of the items on here, so I live within 500 feet. Yeah, so he can't vote on those. So uh, are there, is there anyone else who would like to pull one of the items on the consent calendar tonight? Anybody in the audience tonight? Uh, commissioners? Madam Chairperson, I do not want to pull an item, but I would like to ask a question with regards to one of the consent items. It won't take long unless you want me to pull it just for one question. Uh, sometimes it depends on the question. Let's see, is anybody else pulling anything else? No. Okay. W and so g why don't you start? We'll it's start the 1550 McGregor Drive. That's uh, item the, A. The, yes, the uh, minutes that we just approved called for us to uh, uh, direct staff to come back with regards to the pod for the recycling. And uh, obviously as a consent item, you can't really do that I well. But I here's my question, and it has nothing to do with the pod. I would like to know from the Public Works Director whether or not this project is going to go out for bid and whether or not the plans and stuff that we have before us did go out for bid. 
Okay, I would like to pull uh, that item as well. Oh, so well, maybe let's, then. Well, yeah, <laughs> well, it won't be too long, Steve, so don't go far. Um, so let's pull item A for discussion, and we can, we can, I think we can discuss that um, uh, just prior to the um, Plum, Street. Plum Street. Okay, so uh, we'll do five A. So we'll do that'll be five A. Plum Street will be five B. And then we'll move on to Lawn Way as 5C. Um, so, so do, do I have a motion? Let's see. I'll is move there, the is consent agenda with the changes. The remainder of the consent agenda has been moved. Is there a second? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. So for those of you who are here, sometimes it gets a little confusing, so I'm just going to let you know. For those of you <laughs> who are here on item B, El Salto, uh, both of the Emerald Streets, and 40th Avenue, yours have been approved, and so you may, unless you're fascinated by this project, <laughs> <laughs> this, this evening's uh, proceedings, you can, be, you're free. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to the neighborhood. Hope you do well. Mm -hmm. All right, then we'll go on to item, uh, we'll go on to public hearings, and we'll begin with item uh, 5A, McGregor Drive. And um, I think we should probably just do a, uh, a cursory staff report on on it so that those in the audience and at home know understand what this is about okay thank you um, the item before you is 1550 McGregor it's a new multi-use park um, along McGregor Drive this is a conditional use permit coastal development permit tree removal and a design permit um, before you is a layout of the park so any questions you may have we can discuss um, there will be a pump track, a skate park, and a dog park incorporated into the multi-use park, as well as a pod um, for Hope Services, which you can see is at the end of the parking lot, and a new area of conc a concrete pad will be placed there for that service. Um, the placement of the pod did not utilize any of the, con any of the parking that was planned for the site. These are images of the different types of fences that will be utilized throughout the park. Also, there was a question about multimodal connectivity during the last planning commission. The, the car is one of the better ways to get there for safety. There's also a bike lane that can get you to the park um, along the streets. There is not an agreement that's between the state um, park and the city of Capitola for access through the rail trail. And this is an image of the Hope Service donation pod where used clothes, household goods, and e-waste can be dropped off between the hours of 10 and 7 p.m. There'll be a, someone manning the pod at all times, seven days a week. Well, not at all times, between the hours of operation, um, which we felt would benefit the site to have someone there at all times. And any questions you may have, we're happy to answer. Um, staff recommends that the Planning Commission open the public hearing and approve the project 13-174 based on the conditions and findings for approval. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, staff. Any questions of staff? Okay, then I'll open it for the public <coughs> hearing. Well, uh, can, you want to make a presentation as a staff presentation before we no, open Public it? Works, Steve Jesperg, just here to answer any questions you may have. Okay. Ron? Question of My question was the idea of going out for bid on the project itself, plus how did we procure all the plans that are before us to now, tonight? Or did they go out for bid or was there a necessity to do that? There was not a necessity. The selection of the design art landscape architect fell below our guidelines to go out and procure what proposals. Was, what's the dollar amount on that now? Uh, we're under $10,000 so far into the project. Um, as far as construction, the construction will go out to bid for the plans. You see here we are in the process of preparing construction documents now. So that will go out to bid for you know, our typical 30 to 45 days, and uh, we will award a contract to the lowest responsible bidder. So I think I heard you right. The plans that we have before us, which are conceptual and the actual construction drawings are going to be under the limit of needing to go out to bid on the part of the city? For design purposes, yes. Thank you. 
Is, is 10,000 the, the limit? No, I think it's 25,000. I believe it is 25, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Well, I was curious about that. Thank you. Any other questions of Mr. Jesberg? Thanks, Steve. Uh, my, the reason that I wanted it pulled, but I, I think I've changed my mind about it, was that I just really didn't feel the pod belonged there. I thought it was sort of a last-minute thing and got put there. And, but I do think there's a trade-off having some eyes and ears on the park, uh, you know, every minute that it's open. And as long as we hold them to that, I think it's worth it. I, could I make a, ma a comment on the pod also? I kind of had the same feelings you did. Um, but my real concern with it is that uh, while the uh, discussion in the staff report and conditions and the rest of it call for the, uh, the work done by this group to be totally enclosed, I visited some of the other sites, not their sites, but other sites that have recycling and the rest of it. And they seem to grow out around while they're sorting things and the rest of it. And I can see them going into those parking spaces and other things, and I'd like to alert staff that if this is what they agreed to, they better stay in the pod or I'll be out there complaining. Mm -hmm. Yeah, should we, I guess we should, it doesn't, it's not going to do any good to put it in the conditions. Uh, it's us enforcing it anyway, so, um, and, and I think for them to know that we are, one of the reasons we're approving this is that they will have someone on site. That's a benefit to us and a trade-off for us, so we take that seriously. Any other comments, or uh, I'll entertain a motion on this. I'll move the, the item. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. The second item on uh, the consent calendar is the moved item of 507 Plum Street which is, and 712 Capitol Avenue, which is an amendment to an approved design permit for a detached single car, car garage in the neighborhood commercial zoning district. Staff report, please. Uh, Madam Chair, it's my understanding that the applicant has uh, pulled this because they want to talk about the exception to the utilities undergrounding. If it's the Commission's pleasure, we could forego the staff report and hear from the applicant. Uh, but we do have a presentation prepared, if that would be your preference. I'm all right with it, as long as everyone else is. Okay. Right. It's a pretty straightforward. We've already approved this, and um, the applicant is coming back to ask that we uh, ask a favor of us. So please come forward. And Hi. Oh. Terry David. Hi, Terry. I was wondering if I could have an acceptance to that rule. Um, there happens to be a box, PG&E box, down at the bottom of the base of the pole, of course, my luck, and it has some form of grounding rods or something that take care of the main gas line. And I don't know how they're going to be able to go underground with it. Have they told you they couldn't? Uh, they, they, I just got a hold of them, and they said that one, once I went through the application part process, that they would uh, write a letter. And That's as far as they went. The, what it would entail, because this goes down to protect our gas line from eroding. And it happens to be right at the base of the pole. There are some pictures. I'm sorry, Steve Jesper left. To we could use his expertise on this right now. Um, are there any questions? I, I, I don't know pictures. enough to, about this to know I have what questions to ask. This is an image of the site, and... Um, I believe this is the area where the utilities is going to be. Right at the corner, yes. That's where the pole is. And are you, are you uh, I would think it would be best for us to wait to see what their letter says to you, but are you trying to break ground and that's why you need to do I this I would now? like to be able to get started on it as soon as possible. Yeah, I've been, this has been, as a lot of you are familiar with, this is the third go around. And One possible option the commission may want to consider would be to grant a conditional exception if a letter is provided from the utility provider saying it's infeasible or they will not do it, where we would grant that exception, but sh absent that, that we would still uphold we have that a requirement. We gas man here, retired. Maybe you could give us some... <laughs> well, I was, gonna, I was gonna ask a question. <laughs> sure. What, what you talk to is a, uh, a facility that's for what they call cathodic protection. What it does is keep uh, electrolysis from eating into gas lines and things of that nature, but what you're asking for is an exception to the overhead rule, which means that you would bring your uh, service drop in underground, and of course, if it ever went to an underground district, you'd 
be exonerated from it in the future because you would have the work already done. And so I'm a little concerned about you're saying that the trench that they'd have to dig for the overhead uh, would somehow interfere with the cathodic protection? Yeah, because they have to dig up. They can't just dig a little trench to it. They're going to have to dig up all around that pole and disturbing it. That's, I, I'm, I'm no expert on it. I just had well, saw I'd the box like there and the I had letter. asked. Okay, that's fine. No. Uh, do they indicate when, the, when they might be sending I have letter? to go through the application part, and that's my concern, that I'm going to get a bunch of money out again and then find out that it's going to be way over what I can budget, and yet I'm going to have a third time of a lot of money wasted. Yeah. I just want to build a garage. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions of the applicant? I mean, it. I, I'd like to make a suggestion. Perhaps we could allow them to start construction, and upon receipt of the letter, make a determination at that time. Is that possible? I think it's he's gonna, we're going to let him yeah. construct it no matter what. So, yeah. does that suit you? Um, that would be fine. The only thing is, doesn't the pipe have to run up through the foundation into the where the electrical box is? If it's it doesn't, okay. No, I think it just stubs out at the street, and then later on. We'll get it. Uh, from well, the I, I see what you're saying. If it, if your yeah. overhead it, weatherhead's coming into the the wall there, it would it would use, typically come up through the uh, foundation. Yeah. I don't know how much time it's going to take pg need to get that letter to. I mean, you have a little bit I of time know. if you got. I I just talked to him. Flu. Luckily, he got back to me pretty pretty fast. But I have a phone message if you want to hear the explanation of what he said was there. Whether that, that makes sorry, any I, difference. I'm sorry, sir. I misunderstood. That he is stating that you go ahead through the application, but he would write a letter saying that if, if in fact, that device is there, that they could not do an underground utility. That, that they would, ha that he'd be able to talk to you at that time about it or present a letter. So they're saying to you they think that it's not feasible to do it. Um, it sounded that way to me, but. Okay. And then I guess what you're asking is. If his letter does not state that fact that um, it's not going to interfere with your ability to put it underground, then you feel like you're going to be. I feel like I'm probably going to be over budget because yeah. it, it's already expensive enough, which I figured that in because I've come up to this that it is required to go underground. But now that I have this lovely luck that I have, that there's this box down at the bottom after I'm three quarters of the way through the process again. Yeah. I was unaware of it before, <coughs> otherwise I would have tried addressing it. Well, I think, did you did you ask us before about not uh, being, getting an exception to undergrounding? I seem to remember you had asked that yes, before. We, yes, I did. Yeah. But I had no idea that it was anything related. I was just trying to keep the financial cost, and I realized that that's just part of the code, and that I accepted, yes, okay, I'm going to have to do it. But okay. now then I'm getting something else thrown at me. Okay, thank you. I think unless we have any further questions, we'll close the public hearing portion of it, unless there's someone else who's here to speak about this. And we'll confer amongst <coughs> ourselves. Okay. Thank you. Thank we'll you. call you back if we need it. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, if I, might, I, I would think during initial construction phase, if, even if the letter hasn't been received and it has to come up to the foundation, you can make provisions for that in the foundation, I believe. Right. You so could, you I, could I don't think that should preclude beginning construction without the letter. I, I, I could be uncomfortable with that. I, I think that, as uh, Director Grinoa um, informed us, that if we go ahead and allow him construction, start his construction anyway, and, and then upon proof that PG&E is saying it's not uh, possible to do the underhead, that we grant him the variance. But outside of that, I don't, I don't see any other way around it. Yeah, I don't think there would be any additional expense to make that provision in the foundation to no. bring the utilities <laughs> in. So we would ask the applicant to bring the letter uh, into the planning department when he receives it, and we'll give him the the next phase of the uh, the building permit. You'll, we'll, you'll give him a certain phase through, and then ask him to come back with the letter. Yeah, the, commit, the condition would stand absent right. a receipt of a letter from PGD saying that it's infeasible. Okay. Excellent. All right. Is there a motion to that? I just have a quick question. Is there any consideration for if they come back and they say, you know, it's feasible, but it's going to cost you ten times what it would normally cost? Do we want to make any allowance for that in our approval? 
because I think if they come back and they say that it's exorbitantly expensive, which is another fear that, that he has, I think it's more likely for PG&E to come back and say that than that it's not feasible at all. Mm -hmm. And do we want to make, can we make allowance for that? I wonder if PG&E picks up some of that. You know, I know PG&E will, uh, will pick up, they have been known to pick up expenses here and there, and if they would pick up the, the expense of that portion of it if that were the case. I mean, they cut down a big, huge palm tree for me. They do, they do things like that. I can't talk for no, PG&E. I know you can't. <laughs> I'm well, sorry, I, have, I'm sorry I told you so much about cathodic protection. <laughs> let's let it stand the way uh, the two commissioners have proposed it, and we'll entertain a motion to that effect, and then we'll go, for, we'll go along with that, and at the same time, if it does come in quite a bit over, you can try to um, get PG&E to absorb, you know, the, I, I see no reason why one property owner should be penalized more than others because their particular situation has something unusual. Or at that point, he could come before us and ask for the exemption then. Right, yeah. right. Okay. Motion? Okay. I'd move. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion no, carries. No, I'm yet. a no, okay. and my no has nothing to do with the motion. I absolutely concur with what you're doing, but I was no on the project before. I would like to get the fence down and make it a real front yard. And I didn't. I was unsuccessful at that. So I remember that. Okay. Just consistency. So there are four eyes and a no. Do you want me to? Do, yes, if you need to do that, that's fine. The motion passes four to one. Um, commissioners Welch, Smith, Ruth, and Ortiz in favor. Commissioner Graves opposed. Thank you. We're still getting used to new California laws about <laughs> this kind of thing. So good luck with that. All right, now we'll, we'll go back to the original public hearing agenda, and we'll start with 110 Lawn Way, uh, which is a design permit variance and coastal development permit application for an addition to a single family home in the Central Village Zoning District. Staff report, please. Thank you, Chairperson Ortiz. The application before you tonight is a design permit, coastal permit, and variance at 110 Lawn Way. 110 Lawnway is located within the Central Village District. The property is outlined in yellow on the screen. Um, in 1987, the City of Capitola established the Lawnway Six Sister Historic District. The blue outline is the district boundary. The district is the larger area or environment in which the historic property is located. The relationship of the buildings to each other, setbacks, orientation, views, driveways and walkways and streets, or in this case, the public right-of-way, together create the character of the district. There are a total of 22 units within the Lawnway Six Sister Historic District. As described within the National Historic District Statement of Significance, the Lawnway District is characterized by cottages lining Lawnway that are uniform in scale char and character but diverse in detail, texture, and fenestration. While the exterior walls are all flush with the public walkways, creating an uninterrupted and formal regimen of structures, there is a mix of wide overhanging eaves and no eaves, of weatherboard and wood shingle siding, and of recessed, chamfered, and flush doorways. The one and two-story cottages which line the lawn are good representation, representative examples of Capitola's early 20th century bench um, beach cottage architecture and are unique in their formal arrangement around this pedestrian way. It is the walkway, it's, the walkway itself is significant in the local landscape feature. Um, important by virtue of its association to the 20th century development and relationship to the surrounding architecture. Of the units within the district, 17 are contributory and 5 are non-contributory. The contributory buildings are represented on the screen as the dotted buildings. A contributory pro property is a building, structure, or object on site within the boundaries of the district that contributes to the historic integrity or architectural qualities of the historic district. Um, contributory structures maintain the characteristics of the district as well as the historic integrity. The dark gray buildings outlined represent the non-contributory properties within the district. Non-contributory structures either lack in historic integrity or no longer maintain the characteristics of the district. There are five non-contributing properties within the district. 
110 Lawnway is a non-contributory property within the district. It's outlined in green. The green arrow on the screen points to the original cottage at 110 Lawnway. In 1964, following a flood, the original cottage was condemned by the city and demolished by the owner. Um, a new structure was constructed the same year. The home built in 1964 is a single-story cement block home with a flat roof. The flat roof is utilized as a roof deck and has a visible wrought iron railing. There is a single front door with large aluminum casement windows on either side. On the side elevation fronting North Lawnway, there is no existing windows or doors. The structure is non-contributory non due to the lack of historic integrity. It is also important to note that two of the five non-contributory units within the district are within the six sisters, the center units. Um, there are five two-story structures within the district, two of which are in Lawnway. Um, there is one contributory two-story home located at 104 Lawnway and two and one two-story home at 132 Lawnway that is non-contributory. On November 7th, staff brought a conceptual review, November 7th, 2013, staff brought a conceptual review discussion to the Planning Commission regarding an addition within the Lawnway Residential District. All development within the Central Village Zoning District is subject to the Central Village Design Guidelines. The guidelines allow the Planning Commission to exercise discretion within the review of an application, unlike the rigid development standards found in the zoning ordinance. Guideline number two for the Lawnway residential overlay is shown on the screen. During the conceptual review, the Planning Commission provided staff with direction on guideline number two, which states, no structure shall increase in habitable area of the existing unit. The height and the structure shall not be increased to add additional stories to the structure. During the November 7th meeting, the Planning Commission reviewed the two concepts relevant to guideline number two. During the meeting, the Commission did not come to consensus, but a majority articulated that due to the unique circumstances of the existing property, they would consider additional habitable area within the, a design that is compatible and to scale with the surrounding historic homes and maintains the character of the district. The Planning Commission also voiced concern for the impact of incremental changes throughout the district and stressed the need to fi for findings that are unique to the property. Staff also raised concerns for the scale of the concept. The wall height of the existing structures was much taller than the surrounding historic structures. Staff requested modifications to the wall height to complement and to be in scale with the other properties in the district. Um, the applicant submitted the updated design of the single-story home with the side gabled roof as seen, roof as seen on the screen. Um, the, a south-facing deck with wood railings and a shed roof is proposed within the roof structure. Exterior materials include fiber cement shingles within the roof eaves and fiber cement board lap siding on the side elevations. The existing aluminum windows will be replaced with clad wood windows with a six-inch trim. This design was reviewed by the Architectural and Site Committee on February 13th. All modifications to materials requested by the architect were made after that meeting. The image on the slide is the streetscape from the architectural and site review meeting. During this meeting, historian Carolyn Swift explained that the one story explained that one story buildings are a character defining design element of Lawnway's historic district. Ms. Swift expressed continued concern for the negative impacts that the proposal's massing might have on the district as a whole. Please note the differences in the roof pitches of the home at 110 Lawnway and the surrounding structures. The red line highlights the moderate 812 pitch found throughout the district. The original design at 110 Lawnway, shown on the screen, includes a slightly steeper 1012 pitch. This image shows an overlay of the 812 pitch on the original design reviewed by the Ark and Site Committee. In response to Ms. Swift's concerns, the architect amended the plans to include an 812 pitch to match those within the district. The bottom streetscape shows the current design with an 812 roof pitch. This change in roof pitch lowered the height of the, by an additional two feet. 
In this image, you can see how the existing wall height of the cement block home exceeds the wall height within the district. Since the conceptual review, the architect addressed concerns with scale throughout um, through decreasing the wall heights to approximately 10 feet 3 inches as well as increasing the roof overhangs. Staff finds that the current design of the home is to scale with the district due to these two modifications. Um, staff drafted five unique findings in support of allowing increased habitable area and height at 110 Lawnway. These findings can be found on page 116 of your packet. The Central Village Design Guidelines articulate preservation policy that infill development should complement the existing historic resources and maintain the character of the district as a whole. The guidelines also acknowledge that certain design factors may have to be balanced with others in order to reach an optimal design. Lawnway is a treasure for the city of Capitola as evidenced in the original Camp Capitola. The home at 110 Lawnway does not contribute to the district's history or architectural features. Staff finds that the proposed design is to scale and compatible with the overall district. Within the Central Village District, a substantial remodel requires that parking requirements be met. There is currently no parking on site. The existing home is required to have two on site covered parking spaces. The parking requirement for the existing home plus the new addition remains the same, two uncovered parking spaces. There's currently no parking on site and therefore the applicant is requesting a variance to the parking requirement. Staff finds that by requiring the on-site parking, the property owner would be deprived of a privilege enjoyed by other property owners in the district. We also find that strict adherence to the on-site parking requirement would require the first story garage would um, would require a first-story garage which would not be compatible with the district. Also of note is that there is no increase in the non-conformity of the parking. The parking requirement has not increased between the existing conditions and the proposed addition. Um, staff recommends that the Planning Commission review the application and approve the project application based on the conditions and findings for approval. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for staff? Okay. None. Does the applicant wish to come forward and speak? Uh, good evening, Gary Lindeke, uh applicant and uh, representative for Mrs. Ketman, the owner. Um, I think staff pointed out uh, that we took uh, in the previous review uh, back in November both the commission's uh, statement in regards to both massing and scale as well as uh, Dark Van Alstine's uh, recommendation as well and I think that's kind of reiterated in what you see before you this evening. Um, I think the one thing that staff hadn't pointed out that I'd like to make as far as the record goes is that the, the current structure that's there today was actually a requirement from the city that that's what they built um, and we're hoping that this is uh, you know something that the commission could uh, could accept as being a compromise between what you see today and, and uh, what Mrs. Ketman is asking for and uh, if you've got any other further questions, uh, we're happy to answer. Thank you very much. That's questions for the applicant? No. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Anyone else here to speak about this issue tonight? All right, then we'll bring it back to the commission. Uh, comments? I have one comment, and I just want everybody to, to know um, I did reach out to Carolyn Swift today and speak with her about this project. She was traveling, so I could not show her the plans. But I had the discussion about the change in the pitch of the roof. And she looked very favorably upon that and felt that it would address, um, if not all, most of her concerns about the massing. So she was, she was very happy with that um, change. Thank you. Comment? I just have one comment on, it'd be, uh, I think it would be added to condition 14 about if there's any broken driveway approaches, curb, gutter, sidewalk during construction. Uh, also, I think the lawn area should be mentioned in there also. Well, I think they ought to put it, take out the driveway curb and gutter and just say broken sidewalks and lawn area because there are no curb gutters inside. Well, they have to cross over the curbs, gutters, and sidewalks to get into the area with yeah, any If they come in from San Jose area. Avenue, you're correct, yeah. There is access in the alley, too. Back to yeah, that's true. Uh -huh. I, other, other comments? I have none. I have only one comment. I just wish that, and I... <coughs> 
I looked at the plans pretty carefully. I wish that the east elevation uh, was somewhat better. When they showed you the the, the seascape or the, the uh, there it is there uh, it, it 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 you know it looks like a, a blank wall except for the upstairs small window. Uh, I know that what's inside can you know would ruin the inside plan of the house. It's just that uh, it doesn't, in my mind, really match the houses immediately to the north of it on that east elevation. But it's not enough to make me not vote for it. Okay. Any other comments? I have a couple comments. I was originally not in favor of this, but I, I've changed my mind on it, and I'll tell you why. Um, I think the changes that the applicant has made are, are significant, and uh, also the fact I was going to change my mind anyway, but the fact that Carolyn Swift also agrees, I feel even more comfortable uh, voting in favor of this uh, because it's non-conforming and also because I talked to staff today and they tried to reach out to the state historic preservation folks not talking about this particular um, application but just talking about districts and conforming non-conforming how you you know what gets you kicked out of it and um, they heard nothing back from the state and my feeling is the state's really not paying close attention to these kinds of things unfortunately but I, I don't think that we're in any grave danger with this of being um, you know of, of the state swooping down tomorrow and um, saying that uh, we, we're going to lose our designation because of this. So I, I'm comfortable with this application. One of the things I'd like to see staff do and l may, maybe us consider is exempting the Lawnway and Six Sisters um, of, of any further future parking requirements in our new ordinances so that they don't have to go through this. I think we can make findings that this is an historic district and that it won't, it won't affect any other village uh, folks who come with applications wanting to um, be exempt with parking. This is this is a these are very specific buildings, and uh, I'd like to see them not have to ask for a variance. I don't know if there's any Makes support sense. for that, but okay. So uh, is there a motion? I'll Would make a motion. We move. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thanks so much. Congratulations. You're welcome. All right, then we'll move to the last item on tonight's agenda which is 1740 Wharf Road, <coughs> and it's a design permit and variance coastal development permit and tree removal permit for a new single-family residence in the single-family automatic review zoning district. Madam Her Chairperson. Three of us live within, oh, three three of of us live well, within this, 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 this yeah. within 500 feet of this project, and so uh, there won't be enough of us to vote on it uh, if all three of us recuse ourselves. So someone is ready with uh, straws and we're going <laughs> to take a straw and uh, Lynn, I'm going to read the document so state law prohibits public officials from acting on a matter in which they have certain Tuck economic interest three planning Tuck commissions have disclosed to justifying conflict of interest in decisions take them back go modify the straws don't work Avert your eyes. <laughs> Not that I oh, care. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> you may have Without these conflicted the members, the there's no quorum. Uh, Madam Chairperson, no, while they're, oh, while sure, they're sure, getting the straws yeah, out, yeah. Under uh, the rule I of ask that uh, if there's going to be a long director's report or a commission. There isn't. There isn't okay. okay, so. Un there will oh, not okay. be a long Under director's the rule report. Of necessity. So whoever is recused, uh, a public Commissioner official. Ruth will take over the meeting. And <laughs> and uh, the uh, those and do that on Commissioner Graves and I will bid you adieu for tonight. Uh, okay, and good luck with that. Who won? Can I just stay here? In mm -hmm. my yeah, I think you can. Okay. 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 You guys, you're on your own. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> the commissioner that randomly selected the shortest straw is Commissioner Smith. Com Commissioner Smith may participate in the decision under the rule of necessity. The other conflicted commissioners must recuse themselves and leave the room before the discussion item begins. Thank you. Conflicted's a harsh word, isn't it? Conflicted, yeah. We have conflicts. And because um, Chairman Ortiz has recused herself and has to leave as vice chair, I'll, um, I'll chair this portion of the meeting. So, staff report, please. Okay, thank you. 
Um, before you this evening is sorry, 1740 Wharf Road. And the applicant just gave me a flash drive that I want to minimize. Okay, you, before you tonight is 1740 Wharf Road, coastal development permit and a design permit for a new single family home in the R1 district. As you can see on the image, the home is located next to the Shadowbrook restaurant and also a single family residence. Um, 1740 Wharf Road is located in the R1 district next to the visitor serving district. And there are different setback requirements and height regulations between the two districts. Um, the application before you tonight complies with the lots, lot size maximum floor area ratio and parking requirements of the R1 zoning district. The applicant at is asking for requesting a, um, a variance for the setback re requirement. It, the application meets the front yard setback and the rear yard setback, but the side yard they're asking for um, a variance. The original application is shown on the screen with a four foot five inch setback on either side as required by code. During, and here you can see the existing conditions of the trolley building on the adjacent property and there's actually a 10 foot setback between the property line and the home to the south. Um, during the last review by Planning Commission it was suggested that Planning Commission would support a variance if the home was moved further away from the trolley car. The applicant has made this change and has realigned the home to be right along the property setback and as I stated previously there's now 10 feet between the edge of this home and the neighboring home at 1730 Wharf Road um, creating a new 8 foot 10 inch setback to the north. Um, staff supports the variance. The property is located at 1740 Wharf Road adjacent to the Shadowbrook restaurant. The Shadowbrook restaurant cable car is located one foot off the north property line and is a local landmark. Decreasing the setback requirement will protect the local landmark while not depriving the property owner of privileges enjoyed by other properties in the district. Also granting the variance permit will not constitute a grant of special pr privileges inconsistent with limitations on other properties in the vicinity in the zone. Um, there are th three changes made to the project also. One window was removed along the north elevation. Um, another window is reoriented. The fire code um, will not allow a window right on a property line so therefore they brought the window to a 45 degree angle on that corner as seen in blue. And the last was um, the Planning Commission had asked for a soil study and also engineering. Um, Richard Irish is here tonight. He's a registered civil engineer. He stated in a letter that the site can be shored safely and not impact the neighboring structure. And he also reviewed the soil study and said that that continues to apply. Um, also, I have an image here of the um, green roofs for the structure if you have any questions. And the staff recommendation tonight is that the Planning Commission approve the application based on the conditions and findings for approval. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, at um, this point we open the, the public hearing. So if there's anyone in the public that would like to speak on this issue, um, feel free to come forward. Applicant first. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Bill Fisher. I'm the architect and with me is my associate Courtney Hughes who is the principal designer on this building and uh, we're here to answer your questions and thank you for the suggestions about moving the building. It worked out good for okay. us. Thank you. thank you. Are there any questions for the applicant? So I have a concern about the green roof, Bill. Yes. And I think you recall when you used to live down in Riverview, the condo project that was built across the creek yep. and their garages had the green roof which continually failed and leaked and yep. uh, they had to come in at great expense to each one of the property owners there and change those roofs. Absolutely. And I'm concerned that... Uh, we would never do a roof like that. <laughs> and I'm, I've heard, I've learned a, 
about an hour ago that that's a requirement of the green woofs in Capitola that we do them that way, that we actually put the dirt on the roofing. And I, I think that's insane. The last roof I did like that in Capitola was on El Camino Medio, and we put the dirt directly on the roofing, and I've had sleepless nights about it ever since. I think it uh, doesn't make sense because the roots, no matter what the manufacturers of the roofing membranes tell you, I think it's just bad practice to put roots on top of roofing. So what is the purpose of the green roof in this particular case? Is It, it looks good. From across the creek? It, it looks good from wherever you see this building uh, because the, we're going to intending to have plants that bush up and, and spill over the top of the little short parapet. And it's strictly for looks. There's no functional reason ever to put plants on a roof. It makes no environmental sense in, in Capitola to do that. It's strictly a, a visual thing that we like. So with, this, with the city's requirement that you use dirt up there, do you have an alternative? Well, we, we, don't, we don't mind using dirt. What we're alternative is to uh, use trays. So these are basically containers that are a couple of inches thick. And they're how big are they, like 18 inches There's square? There's an image. The thumb drive that I gave you has the, um, some images of these types of modular green roof trays. Yep. And they come in. You can get a variety of different types of plants and different depths to them. And they're self-contained, so they're... They, they cover a large okay. space, and they can, if there are problems with them, they can be switched yeah, out. Yeah, if the plants okay. die, you can switch them out. Here's the idea. The specific varieties of plants haven't been chosen, but this is okay. the... So it's actually not part of the structure itself. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. Exactly okay. right. It's heavy enough not to be blown around in a windstorm. Too. Okay. But there's, there's a capital requirement for... I, I, I want to clarify that. Um, there's no Capitola requirement for um, a dirt roof. I, I just I had, um, reached out to the applicant prior to ask if these were all in containers because I remembered during the last planning commission a discussion on containers and that they should be prepared to discuss that tonight. So. Well, yeah, we would. Um, it, I think I think any plant on a roof should always be in a container. So if it dies, you can replace it. And so to, you prevent the roots from getting to the membrane. That's my reasoning. Now, if you, I can understand how uh, it gets to be a matter of semantics. If you were to use words like pots and things like that, people have ideas of large vertical cylindrical pots on plants, and all of a sudden it becomes a deck. And, and uh, the building official I know is concerned about having these roofs somehow turn into decks. And that's not our intention. So when we say container, we mean something that's like a couple of inches thick and 18 inches square and covering the entire area that we've designated. And then I have one other uh -huh. just question about the size of the coffee bean plants that you're going to be planting on that north wall. Uh, we brought our landscape architect, Tom Shear, with Shear, who can... Uh, he knows everything about anything green. <laughs> I don't know anything. All I know is it's green. Actually, I, you know, I, I did 10 minutes worth of research on, online about coffee bean plants, and they sound like they grow fairly substantial and fast or decorative, but I'm just curious, uh, the initial planning, if it's going to be a pot this big or if it's going to be you know, a five-gallon pot or a You've already introduced boxed yourself. coffee bean plant? What? Um, first of all, it's called coffee berry. Oh, coffee berry. Just want to okay. make sure. Um, <laughs> The initial sizes, I believe, uh, we called out for a five-gallon container. It should be in the range of about uh, three and a half to four feet high. Uh, in fact, we're talking to a, um, <clears throat> a nursery down in it, Elkhorn Native Plant Nursery, about potentially contract growing. Hasn't been decided yet. So potentially those, those plants could be even larger than that by the time we, we plant them. Okay. But eventually they'll get to from uh, on the range of about 8 to 12 feet, and they're a true native, California native. Yeah, what I read, it sounds like they, they spread. They spread, really and they're dense. Yeah, they're, they're really a good water. shrub. Okay. Very little water. That's it? Anything else? That's it. 
DJ, any questions? I have nothing. I just have one question about the, the, um, the coffee berry plant. Um, if they start out to be three and a half, four feet tall, how long will it take for them to get another couple of feet on them? They're rated as a moderate growth plant, so I would say we're probably looking at somewhere in the two and a half to three year uh, range before they get to a substantial height. Okay, thank you. I should mention we also have Richard Irish here who's prepared to speak about anything having to do with the soils or the shoring or the structure of the building. Okay, thank you. Do we have any questions for Richard? No, unless the soils have changed in the last uh, 33 years when that initial report was written. <laughs> Did you have any questions as well? I don't have any questions about the shoring. The, the report was really thorough and um, seemed to cover a lot of ground that we had questions on from the last meeting. So I think we're, we're good. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience that would like to speak on this issue? Come forward. Hey, Bruce. Bruce Archer, Cliff Avenue, Capitola. Um, I agree with Mick um, on the green roof. There, there's all kinds of different ways of doing re green roofs. I've gone to multiple presentations on how to build green roofs. Um, my concern, first off, is the property is for sale as a buildable lot. This application, not. N this application before you isn't necessarily going to get built, correct? It's a possibility. Do we have a buyer that's already bought it and he's the one that wants this designed and built? No, no we don't know that. Okay. Um, back to the green roof. In reading the uh, staff report, I think it said that it was not going to be accessible by the homeowner, the green roof. Is that correct? It, it will not meet accessibility requirements for the building code, so it should not be accessed by the homeowner. Correct. Okay, so who's going to make sure that this green roof stays alive? I think that needs to be a condition that that green roof stays alive. Otherwise, it's going to be seen from everywhere as a brown, dead roof. Green roofs, by definition, aren't necessarily green in, 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 in a Mediterranean climate like we have, most green roofs in this area uh, have um, cacti, very low water use plants. So, you know, there's that concern. Um, so that was my concern about the green roof, was whether or not there's going to be a condition that says that green roof as built um, is going to stay alive and, and if it's not then someone's going to need to go in and take care and make sure because there are views from obviously Sh Shadowbrook and from the path across the, the street looking at it we don't want to look at, a, at an eyesore. Um, the other concern I had was Shadowbrook. Um, I've listened to horror stories of people that get um, uh, applications for subdivisions around airports and people buy the houses and oh boy this is great I got a nice house and then all of a sudden they go to the city council and complain I don't like the noise from the planes landing. Um, they're going to live right next to Shadowbrook and any anybody that buys that house has to know that occasionally Shadowbrook it's a little loud. I mean I was talking with Gail the other day and she says occasionally she, she hears Shadowbrook from her bedroom window. Uh, my parents hear Shadowbrook from the bedroom or across, from their bedroom across across the, the creek too. So what you know what's going to happen right next door? I, I'm not sure whether Shadowbrook has thought of that or whether the planning commission has thought about that. But at some point, whether whether it's legally you can put that in the condition or not, that you know you can't complain about the noise because you knew about that there's going to be some noise going into it. But Shadowbrook stays open later than 10 o'clock at night, and sometimes it gets so are we going to have a bunch of police being called to this property because they think Shadowbrook's too loud? It's just things to think about when you're thinking about them. Yeah, Bruce, if I could just respond to that because I have it in my notes here. And I don't know if it would be a condition or a finding, but one of the things I was going to propose, and I can do it now, is that, that the owner 
of the property acknowledges that they're the eventual owner of the property. Well, the current owner acknowledges that there could be substantial uh, uh, noise on, onto the property from the restaurant, and that he be required to disclose that when that property sells. That's a good first step, but it's not going to stop someone from saying, well, yeah, I realize that, but I didn't realize it was going to be that loud. Yeah. Well, that could happen no matter what we do. Yeah, yeah. No, exactly. Okay. Is there anyone else in the audience who'd like to speak on this item today? I know we did get um, another letter, and um, staff, do you want to just want to review the contents of that letter to make it public record, or great? Yeah. How do we do that? Um, we received a letter from the Shadow Brook from Ted Burke, business owner, on Ma March 1st, and. Within the letter, he stated that they support the application as submitted. They appreciate the proposed changes to move the building site an additional five feet to the south. Um, he also asked that they consider additional conditions, one being recognizing that the impacts of construction will be disruptive to our operation with increased noise, dust, detrimental aesthetics, and other building activities, we would like to see a building management plan that would hold the applicant to an expedited but reasonable construction timetable in order to mitigate the effects of our daily commercial activity. Also, to review the landscape plan to assure that existing natural screening be duplicated as much as possible with large size plants and climbing fig or something similar for the north walls and to um, confirm that coffee berry will grow rapidly on that site even though it gets little sunlight. Okay, thank you. Um, any other comments from the public? Seeing none, then we'll close the public hearing portion and bring it back to the commission. Commissioner, comments? Let me start off here. Go for it. Okay, well, not much. Uh, I, think, I think we've moved in the right direction, and I appreciate the house being moved over. I'm comfortable with the soils report and the construction method that's going to take place. I would like to see perhaps a finding that, that it notes that there will be potential significant noise uh, that the property is subject to. And uh, I'm not sure if we can require the owner of the property to, to disclose that uh, at the sale of the property. But if we can, I'd like to see that in included as a condition. We, we could draw up a legal instrument similar to an avigation easement, which requires owners of the property to disclose noise. Um, I would point out, though, that there's really no legal binding effect except that they're disclosed that there's noise impacts. It wouldn't stop them from coming right. to the city council meeting complaining, for instance. But it's something that we could uh, work with the city attorney and the applicant to craft. Okay. And then I notice there's no condition defining the construction hours. Or if it's there, I overlooked it. And... Uh, we would apply the standard construction. Yeah, I know it's nine o'clock at night. Yeah. I would like to see that reduced to six o'clock and just to kind of provide some safeguards to Shadowbrook from the construction noise. And uh, I think we need a condition that applies to the green roof that uh, all vegetation of the green roof shall be maintained in a, in a healthy condition. Okay. It's, um Condition 17 is what calls out the, the construction hours. Is it on there? Yeah. Oh, there it is, yeah. But it does say 9 p.m., so you're proposing to change that to 6, 6 p.m. Okay. Anything else? Nope, that's it. CJ. Well, uh, <coughs> I support this uh, project the first time it came across. I think uh, we cross into uh, difficult territory when we start telling people with legal lots what they can and can't do in, a, in conditions based on a bordering property. And I have a serious concern about that, although I, I do commend the applicant's uh, representation for making those um, changes to compromise with uh, the Shadow Brook. And, and uh, with that, I could support a uh, mixed view of that um, and move this forward. Um, I just want to clarify one thing about the green roof. and. The proposal that we have in front of us is the green roof with these trays and not dirt straight on the roof, correct? And there's no rules against doing it the way that they're proposing to do it. As far as 
I know there are no rules against doing it this way. I will. Che I can check with the building official and make sure. But okay. That's okay. I haven't had the opportunity to do that yet. And I'm sorry, Vice Chair. I, I had a one question for staff. Um, it was brought up that this is uh, not accessible by the um, the owners of the building, the roof being uh, unaccessible, but that's not necessarily unaccessible. Does that, I took that as meaning it's not a habitable space like a deck or something like that. They could access it just like we would get on our roof or yeah. to maintain, do this type of maintenance type thing. So, okay. Yep. Thank you. And I don't see a condition there at this point that says anything about maintaining um, the green roof. And I know that um, a lot of times we'll have conditions about the landscaping and making sure that the landscaping is maintained in an appropriate manner. Can we add a condition um, regarding the green roof and that it is maintained? In I think we can add a condition, but I do have concerns about our ability to enforce it. And it's not a conditional use permit like we often will place those landscape maintenance requirements on. To me, it, it seems very similar to somebody's lawn or to somebody's paint on their house. I don't know if the city has the legal ability to go in and say you need to paint your house because it doesn't look nice anymore. You need to water your lawn because it's not green. Uh, but we can put the condition there and then verify with the city attorney if it's something we could enforce and we can report back to you what we hear. Uh, but in the meantime, we can put the condition there and with the hopes that we are able to enforce it. Okay. Well, the uh, question just for the the applicant, will the will the trays that's contain the plant material for the green roof. What's the height of those? Probably about four, four to six inches. Okay. They don't even use real dirt. Okay. Um, and last but not least, I thought I had read um, a condition that related to the, uh, the business management plan, having a plan before construction begins that talks about how they're going to manage not blocking the street and that kind of thing during construction. But when I went back and read it, I didn't find anything like that. Um, is it possible for us to add a condition that gets a plan in front of Steve Jesper before it starts um, that manages the during the construction process the street access to mm -hmm. Shadowbrook? Yeah, sure, we can yeah. do that. Okay. And I'm still, and I just have to say this, concerned about the the slope and protecting that during construction. But I think that the the experts have have looked at it and they've they've done a good job of of making sure that the soil, um, the construction on that slope is appropriate with the soil that they're dealing with. So um, I would just like to make sure that um, the city pays close attention to that throughout the process and make sure that all of those erosion plans and things that are being put in place are in fact present throughout the whole process. And with th those are all of my comments, so um, I entertain a motion. So we're trying to put that all together in one motion now. <laughs> We've got a condition, uh, let's see, <laughs> go back. A condition regarding the construction hours, uh, a finding regarding the noise, and uh, a condition requiring disclosure that you'll research through the city attorney. Uh, what else? And a Green roof maintenance, if uh, that's possible. Okay. Management plan is required to maintain street access during construction. Okay, that one. I think that was it, right? Yet, was um, there any more, TJ? Public works there. reviewing prior to the beginning of construction. Was that all you? Okay. okay. Okay, then with those uh, additional conditions, I'd move approval of the project. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you very much. And that is the last item on our public um, hearings list this evening. Do we have a director's report? No report tonight. Um, commission communications? Nope. You did nothing? Okay. Um, with that, then we'll adjourn to the next meeting on Thursday, April the 3rd at 7 p.m. here in the chambers. Thank you very much. Oh, we got through that much faster than I could. Should one of these turn it off? I thought we got through for a couple hours. <laughs> <laughs> I thought the report was really well. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Everything that we asked yeah. about.